Hello Richard, um, thanks for coming to talk to me. Could you just um, tell me a bit about yourself and how you got involved in TA? Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you know, I, I had started as a client-centered therapist and then I met Fritz Perls and was actively involved as, as a Gestalt therapist in training. And I had read Games People Play and I did not like it, except for one chapter where he talked about the advantages to games. Mm. And I thought that was a very insightful chapter. And then somebody invited me to a workshop with David Cuffer, and he started putting three circles on the board, and it just really helped me understand some of the dynamics within me, and that just got me hooked. I stayed in the training with David Cuffer, then I continued with Hedges Capers, and I've been actively involved in the TA world since um, 1969. Wow quite some time then. Yeah. Brilliant. So, and you've developed a piece of theory, Relational Needs. Could you just um, tell me what your inspiration was or where, where those ideas came from? Yeah, it, uh, well, it came out of some reading of the psychoanalytic self-psychology literature and some discussion in a seminar. And we began talking in that seminar of 15 really competent trainers and supervisors themselves about what is missing in psychotherapy, what is missing in our clients' lives. Mm -hmm. So we all engaged in an interview kind of research project of raising those questions with each of our clients. So the 16 of us at the end had list and list of things that people talked about that were missing, what they're longing for. And then we did a factor analysis of it and came out with eight relational needs. Now these are needs that all of us have in relationship throughout our lifetime. And they're not needs that we can satisfy for ourselves, maybe temporarily. But these are our needs because we are relational people from infancy to our current age to our deathbed. And, and could you just briefly tell me what these eight relational needs are? First is the need for security in relationship. To be in the presence of somebody who's not going to humiliate us, mm -hmm. not going to hit us, not going to put us down, not reject us. That sense of, I can say anything to the other person and I'm going to get an unconditional positive regard. It is really that sense that Eric Berman, when he said, I'm okay, you're okay. And when we convey that okay, okayness to someone, we're providing that relational need for security in the presence of another person. The second one is the need for validation um, and affirmation in relationship. To have somebody who sees our fantasy as an important means of communication who values our affect as a way to try to express something and who shows that sense of validation in our interest, our curiosity, our non-judgmental approach. Um, the third is to be accepted by somebody who uh, Winnicott called wiser and stronger, someone we could look up to to gain a sense of strength and encouragement, somebody who knows what, what we need in terms of guidance. Now this happens from the little kid looking up to father to say, show me how to be in the world, to, the, to us going to a therapist or a supervisor, needing somebody to rely on who's dependable and consistent or even in our old age, relying on our medical doctor who's going to ease the pain. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's a need that goes throughout yeah, life. Nice. And the next one is the confirmation of personal experience. To be with someone who knows what it's like to have suffered the way we have. This is where the client wants to know, have you been through difficulties in your marriage? Yeah. Yeah. Or do you know what it's like to be so anxious? And that's when it's important for the therapist to engage in a limited self-disclosure. Whereas if in the previous one, if the client is looking up to the therapist 
for as a pillar of strength, self-disclosure is not what they need. Mm. They need the sense of wisdom. And then the fifth one is self-definition. The need to define oneself, to say, this is who I am, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And so many of our clients have been defined by someone else. And they lack that sense of being able to express themselves. And this is one of the reasons why we do so much phenomenological inquiry, asking, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? How do you make sense of that? Each of those phenomenological inquiries helps that person more and more define themselves. Yes, to know who they really are, who yeah. they are. And allied with that is number six, the need to make an impact. The need to say no, to protest, to speak about what I want from the other person, and to receive an acknowledgement of that expression, and to have the other person, if possible, cooperate. So when you said to me, you would like me to come here at a certain time, you're trying to make an impact on me, yeah. and I want to respond to that by saying, okay, mm. I'll be here at this time. Um, Great. And the next is, is to have the other initiate. Now this is one that many TA therapists have a hard time with because they're worried about rescuing the other person. But it's the client who's sitting there painfully alone. They need us to get up out of our chair and maybe come over and sit next to them. Not necessarily to say something, but to initiate that. Mm. Or when a, client, or a therapist is here at a conference and you know you've got a client that you haven't been seeing, maybe leaving a little message on their machine saying, I'm missing you, or I've missed our session, I'll see you next week. Um, some kind of reaching out and initiating. I think that's why people have dogs. Dogs know okay. how to initiate. <laughs> <They're right. Yes. laughs> you know, when you come they home, do. they're at the door, yeah. that tail is wagging. Yeah, they're there. And many people in my practice tell stories about nobody really initiated mm. with them as a kid. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And the last is the need to express love. Now this is the last one we developed. Um, it is the need to express gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation. And when that need is not accepted, it is very frustrating. Mm. Now if you notice in this list of eight, I have the need to accept love, but there, I have not listed the need to receive love. Because if the other person provides security, if they validate us, if they are there to rely on, if they are companionable, if they help us initiate, if they, I mean, if they, if they help us define ourselves, if they initiate, then we feel loved. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's lovely, a really nice explanation, thank you. Could you tell me, um, give me an example of how you've actually used this in your therapeutic work? Oh my goodness, I, I have many, many examples. Mm. But it is something I'm constantly thinking of, both in terms of current relational needs and archaic relational needs. Right? We cannot satisfy in the now needs that were never satisfied in the past. No. And our task as psychotherapists is not to satisfy those archaic needs, but it is to be responsive to those needs, mm -hmm. to help the client become aware that they had such needs, to acknowledge those needs, to talk about how they coped, what body reactions, conclusions, decisions did they come to when those needs were repeatedly not met. Now not meeting those needs once or twice is not the problem. It's the accumulation neglect of those needs yeah. that helps form the script. And to facilitate the clients in grieving for the loss of not having those needs met? Grieving but also being angry about mm. it and looking at how they compensated. Yeah. Then when it comes to current relational needs we always have that decision of do we satisfy the need or do we merely respond to it? Let me give you one brief example. Great. I'm right near the end of a session. Somebody else is waiting for me in the waiting room. 
client said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I've got something very important to say. And I respond to the need by saying, it must be important to tell me right now. And I think I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say, and I think you need to say it, but I can't do it. That's responding to the need, but it's not satisfying. Yeah. Okay. And then I say, I can't do it. Let's make another appointment later this week and begin with that. Yeah. Okay. So there I'm not satisfying the need. No, but you are really accounting for it and hearing That's it. That's right. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And do you see this, how do, how do you see this, this um, theory developing in the future? Well, first of all, there are many more than eight relational needs. These are the eight most commonly spoken about with the group of 16 of us who worked on this project. Mm. Um, so I suspect that there are to be therapists finding other relational needs that are frequent in their practice, mm -hmm. which might change from culture to culture. Yes, that would be interesting. Um, I see other therapists, particularly, probably not me, but looking at how do you apply this to various personality types. For example, when you're working with a narcissistic process, the need to define oneself and make an impact is very strong because it's often been frustrated much earlier in life. Yeah. And the therapist needs to account for that archaic need and how it shapes the personality. When working with a, a borderline, which I prefer to refer to as early affect confusion, mm -hmm. it's so frustrating to the therapist because just as you begin to respond to one need, out comes another need. And you go to respond to that one, and out comes another one, and they are never satisfied because you've got so many needs happening at once. Yeah. And so the therapist, knowing that, doesn't get caught in the counter-transferential trap. So to develop things like that for various personality types may be yeah, a, a direction really somebody else can take this research. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's lovely. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to us today. And yeah, thank you for taking Oh, thank time. you for okay. the honor of being here. All right. Okay.